Welcome to the Coffee Snobs Podcast, where we just really love good coffee. So grab your cup of coffee and join us each episode as we explore any and everything coffee related. From pour overs to lattes to the coffee experience, we explore it all because, well, life's too short to drink bad coffee. Let's go. Hello and welcome to this episode of The Coffee Snobs. My name is Tyler and I am joined by my friend Aaron Beaver today. Hello, hello. Aaron, how are you? Good, man. You? Doing well. Uh, We have a fun episode coming for you today. Uh, Aaron is going to be joined by a special guest, Joe Strothman from Louisville, Kentucky. Yep. Going to be talking about some cool stuff. Uh, But before we get into that, like we do every episode, let's start off with what is new. Aaron? What is new for you in the coffee game? Well, I received a special bag of coffee from the North Shore of Oahu. It's North Shore Blend. It's by Green World Coffee Farms. That's Hawaii, correct? That is Hawaii, right. the big island. Um, man, it, it's uh, it's really good. Uh, my parents were just recently in Hawaii. So they. So you weren't in Hawaii. No, I oh, was not. Oh man, that would have been nice. That would have been nice. But my parents went to this coffee farm, met with the daughter of the owner, wow. and uh, talked coffee. So if I'm getting the story correct, the owner um, loves mild roast, and the daughter likes dark roast. So they meet in the middle at medium. They do. It's. <laughs> Okay, so I've always heard that like Hawaiian coffee is good, like right, like you. Yes, I, I think typically you hear of uh, Kona. Kona. I, I guess that's one of the islands, and they say it's really good because of the volcanic soil. Ash. Right, right, yeah, right. the soil has a certain pH level or something like that. It just really makes the Kona coffee like really good. So this is gonna sound snobbish. Like always. But it just, it's good. Don't get me wrong. Like, I'm yeah. like, it's its far better than anything that you'll get at a local grocery store. Uh-huh. It's just not a lot of flavor. Like, it's not, like, the notes and tones that you would normally get, you don't. So, the blend you got, did you say it was a medium blend? It's a, yes, it is. And it's a house, uh, they call it their house blend. Okay. And so... Uh, or th- let me say this: It's the North Shore blend. Um, it is good by all means. It good is, but not great. It's good but it not great. Like you're Correct. Saying. It's um, it is a ve- it's much better than like any other coffee that you get. Like I said at the grocery store, but it's sure. just not a flavorful. It's like it's not one of those those coffees that you're like, oh my god, like this is yeah. so so good. I've tried it in multiple different processes. That's one of the things that's coming up in the in the podcast with Joe. Uh-huh. Um, some of the conversation and the stuff that he learned um, in this class that he went to. I've tried some different um, things, but yeah, it was it's it's good. I the the verdict is still out. But Tyler, what's up with you? Uh, not a whole lot. I actually, I think I discussed this on a previous episode. My sister uh, was kind enough to bring me some Guatemalan coffee when she was down there. And I tried it recently. And this is, this sounds kind of weird. Uh, it almost sounds like similar to the coffee you're talking about because it's not bad. It's not great, but I actually did a, uh, at home cupping. No, no, that's snobbish, Mm -hmm. uh, with my buddy Adam and, I'll say that this Guatemalan, it, it tastes like coffee. Yeah. Like, I, I couldn't pick up any kind of notes of anything else. It literally just tasted like you think, oh, like black coffee maybe from like Dunkin' Donuts or somewhere. It just tasted like coffee. So And that's and that's tough. I mean, like, I, that's, that's, that's it's tough. It's hard out there for it, a snob. I mean, it, it's tough when you're trying to – when you start tasting these really, really good cups of coffee uh-huh. and or good roast, and you're like, man, this is so much a variety of flavor, and you're getting all sure. of these uh, different uh, textures and and uh, flavors, uh-huh. and then you get a bag that yeah, which, is again, still good. Like, sure. right, we're not like we're not knocking it, and I'm not 
I don't want to play too much into the snobbish. It's just not a, it's just not one that's like. Yeah. Well, that's okay. I mean, like I said, it's it's good, not great, and there's you know there's nothing wrong with that. It's definitely better than. Now that Guatemalan, I will say, I put it under in my espresso machine. Okay. And, I, it was. It was good in that. Okay. Uh, yeah, I only tried it uh, in like a pour over. Yeah. In a, so in I, a I would try that. I would try that cool. in your espresso machine and see. Oh, I'm glad um, you're enjoying it. Yeah. But Cool. Well, that about wraps up what's new for today. So on to our main topic. Aaron uh, is going to be talking with his good friend Joe. Joe was actually a guest on one of our very early episodes, a, a pour over bonus. Yep. But Aaron, exactly tell me what you and Joe are going to be talking about on this interview. So most Recently, Joe went to a manual brew process class at Sundergrass Coffee. If you followed along with the podcast, you'll know that my love for Sundergrass runs deep. Uh, and so, Joe, they had a manual uh, brew class, and it was it went through five different methods of brew, um, five different brew methods, all dosed. Uh, same and the water temperature the same and it just was after Joe posting it and talking with Joe I was like dude Joe you've got to share what we what you learned because it was incredible it was really really cool that sounds pretty darn snobbish so let's get right into that here we go Joe and Aaron on the interview so this is an exciting podcast. Uh, we set it up earlier with Tyler talking about my good buddy Joe Strothman, but we have an on. We got a remote coffee snob. He's like our undercover, and our good buddy is on today. Joe, thank you for being on the podcast today. I like that I am a uh, the snob on location, uh, remote snob on location. Dude, you are. You listen. I have such a love for Sundergrass and have such a love for Joe Strothman that those two things in just to be able to talk about both of those and talk to both of those, that's really exciting. So uh, let, we're going to get into it real quick. Joe, how has your coffee, what's been new with you in coffee? Like What's, what's new? been new with me in coffee right now is uh, trying to find the best budget beans impossible to mm. fit into my current current financial situation. So... Uh, just really been doing like a lot of budget shopping, trying to figure out, Hey, is there such thing as a good, uh, $9 bag of coffee? And then, uh, really not, uh, really treating no matter the the cost of the bean with care and respect and, uh, really trying to craft out even, even like, Oh man, this is just like a three month old bag of beans that were, you know, mass produced that I bought at the grocery store while I'm still going to brew them you know, as good as I can and get the best out of them. You okay. Know, not just for coffee or not weigh them out, not measure them, not spend the time to take the temperature, uh, not worry about ratios. Like, even though it's like, man, I know I want a 19, $25 bag of beans that I know it's going to be phenomenal. I'm still like trying to like get the best out of it as I can. You know, it's okay. like, okay. So yeah. in your, in your pursuit of, of, because I, I I'm the same, like, Dude, I, I, I'm not I, the McDonald's coffee challenge like you're doing right now, but I'm close. <laughs> so, I, listen, I, I'm, I've been that guy that spent $32 on uh, a bag of beans, yeah. and and now I'm that guy that is you know, just being a little more budget conscious, but I, that's very exciting. I, like, I can't wait to talk with you more on this. Do you have any... Do you have anything that you've like, been like, dude, this surprised me? Anything right off top? Uh, like off top hand, like right off the hand, the things that the the two uh, bag of beans that I like, I've been that, that are consistent that a lot of people can get are the organic single sources that are available at Aldi's. Oh, dude, there's, there's a Peruvian and a Honduran that are both like five bucks for like ten ounce, a 10, 12 ounce bag, and yeah, man, I I put them in my Chemex and they're great. Uh, like they're not, you know, they're not phenomenal, but. They're way better than a Keurig. Yeah, <laughs> for sure, dude. That 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 that's a great place to start. Like th- that organic bean. I'm doing research on it, trying to find more about where the beans are sourced. They've got a lot of details on the bag, but right. uh, I think that would be a good that'll be a good topic here real soon to really dive into that those bags of coffee and how they're able to produce them at the price point that they are. And right. uh, but okay. 
on to on to what we're talking about today, and that is you posted uh, was it like two weeks ago now? Two weeks ago, yep. About you posted about a trip you got to go to to Suntergross where you went through a manual brew class. Well, you know, it, it was uh, it was from like two thirty to four o'clock on a Sunday afternoon, and what they did is they just had their uh, lead trainer uh, Ryan walked through some manual brewing processes. Okay, so this was at Suntergross, right? And and what location yeah. in the in, Norris location? Okay, and that's so in a, Louisville, Kentucky, Louisville, right? Kentucky, right next to Bellarmine College uh, University. It's kind of in the city, uh, and what it is, it's a converted two bay garage. So like metal sided building, probably back in the day had some gas pumps. It might be a thousand square foot, uh, super small location, uh, but they have like just your normal uh, coffee bar like you would see um, seat about 30 people. But then they'll open the garage doors and they have like outdoor seating and they had it right there, (laughs) like right there in their, their retail space, right in front of like where they keep their beans and some of their manual brewers and their coffees and uh, like their tea. How many people were here at this event? Uh, they've done several of them, and Ryan said that this one was the smallest one, and there was like 11 of us, but he said some of the times there's up to 30 people. Wow. The They're free. Uh, you know, it, Hold it's on. Kind it, of, this was free? Oh, it's free. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's kind of like going, uh, you know, you get that free weekend trip to, to Florida, and then you got to sit through that sales pitch for a uh, timeshare condo. <laughs> <laughs> you know, at the end, he's like, "Hey, we got manual brewers on sale, and we're we're running discounts." And you know, it's an opportunity for them to teach you about what they sell, uh, and then in hopes that you, you know, maybe buy some of the product from them. They're not real pushy, but you know, it's kind of like a marketing tool. But dude, this I mean, it's a it's uh, a it's a beautiful concept. I'll tell you this, after I got done, I was like, man, I, I really want to buy a French press because now I know how to use one. <laughs> we're going to get we're going to get into that because, dude, like yeah. I think everybody starts with a French press. But from what I understand is they explained so much of the detail of the manual brew process. And so we're going to go through, I think, how many different brew methods did they cover in this? And, and first off, what was the do you know the title of this of this class or course or what it was? Oh, it was like manual brewing explained. Manual brewing explained. So that's what we're going to call this. That's where we're going to label it. Um, and what were the, f- was it five brewing methods that they went through? Do you remember? So they did a V60. They did a Chemex. They did an AeroPress. They did the French press. And then uh, you got to help me with the pronunciation of it. A, a Kalita. Yeah. We'll and, a, and, a, and a Kalita. Which so that was, uh, is a flat bottom pour over metal yep. uh, conical shape with a flat bottom yep. that has three um, three points to where the coffee distributes. So it's not just like a like a V sixty or Chemex. They all come out of one spot at the bottom of the cone. The Kalia has three exit points. Yeah. Every time I think of that, I think of the, uh, flat bottom girls make the world go round. That's there you go. <laughs> Oh, so good. Okay, so they went through those five brewing methods, Uh and uh, we're going to kind of get into nerdy detail, but they dosed the same, correct? Besides the the French press, everything was dosed the same, correct? That's right, yep. We did everything at a... um we did everything at a 16 ratio. Okay. So 16 uh, to 1 ratio. So uh, that would be, let's say you just, I'm pulling out the calculator right now, but if you did 400 grams of water. We were uh, doing we were doing 38 grams of uh, bean to 600 grams of water. Okay. So that, that tells you where they were starting. So that way, if you want to try any of the things that Joe explains through this or you want to reach out to Suntergross on their Instagram, they're they're great people. Like seriously, uh, and and I'm a hundred percent sure they'll walk you through anything um, that you ask. But uh, through any of the process that we explained today, just know it's thirty eight to six hundred is is what we're doing. So uh, the first one, Joe, do you remember which what well, the first one was? The first one was was a ceramic. V60. So the first was ceramic V60. And so uh, th- what 
what was uh, was there anything enlightened? Because I think from a from a pour over process, a ceramic, you know, you've got your coffee in there. You may pre soak your filter. You may not. You may try to wash the chemicals out. I know some people like pre rinse the filter, and then uh, what was the first thing that he explained? Uh, did he double? the grains did the double the grains for the amount of water so what it means is if you did 36 30 we well said 38, 38. Was, was he doing 72 was that what was he doing everything was 38 okay so 38 and then what was the first dose of water that he put in do you remember well you like for the bloom process yeah, the was, bloom process it was two to, he did everything was two to one okay so so, so, so that, he's doing you know what 64 somewhere around there, whatever 38 times two is, and a 16, 72 grams of water. Yep. Right. So, so that explains, so in this process, uh, let me back up one second. Yep. Cause Ryan took a, took a moment to talk about the fact that like going through paper filters, he said he possibly pre soaked them. He was very adamant about the fact of like washing every paper filter and so much so that again, his private brewing, like he sat down and was like, I wonder what coffee tastes through if I only rinse it for two seconds, rinse it for four seconds, rinse it for six seconds. Oh, wow. So, like, he pre rinses all of, like, they were talking about how they pre rinse all their filters for, I think they, it was a quarter of whatever the end volume is. So, if you're ending up with 600 uh, milliliters of water, you're going to run that through, um, at what 250 milliliters of water to rinse it oh wow because they were saying like that's what they found to remove the paper chemical taste dude yeah well first i mean okay <laughs> like now understand this is manual brew process and this is really where you know i, I know that's an extra step right mm -hmm. but this is where in the pursuit of the best cup of coffee that you can we're not talking about like a, a, a fast the, process. This well, is not a Keurig. Another thing that we talked about too is like, hey, everything that we learned in this class, this is not for your 6 a.m. Monday trying to get out the door coffee. Right. This is for your, uh, it's 10 o'clock Saturday brunch coffee. Like, hey, I got an hour. I'm going to spend the time to make the, to make the drink uh, because it does take time. Yeah. You know, and uh, you're going to take 30, 40 seconds to rinse a filter. You're going to take two minutes to temper your brewers because you're going to bring like the ceramic V60. You're going to pour, you know, 211 degree water over top of it to bring it up to temp. So it's not it's not pulling out heat. So your slurry is not off. Uh, you know, they went through a whole lot of how the manual brew process. It's just as much as about what you drink as how you made it. Dude, uh, love that. Like, seriously, like that's one thing. It. Is a lot of the, a lot of the things they talked about too was like when you buy your man, manual burr, get a notebook and a pen with your manual burr. Ah. So you can collect data. Yeah. Because so, like if you love what you did, it needs to be repeatable. So you can so you're basically writing your own manual for your burr. That's uh, that's why for a long time I had a spreadsheet and like literally I recorded every piece of data. You remember back when my first kettle was a non temperature uh controlled kettle and i was doing like 185 you know and the only way only way i knew that is i had a thermometer uh in the in the kettle that i put in right and like you was pre-measuring that yeah and so and and now knowing what i know which we're going to talk about in in this on this podcast the water temperature like okay so he's preheated i don't want to I, I don't want this to be all over the place so i want to finish through the v60 because <laughs> It's just the way that we talk. So we're right. going into the so, V60. We've tempered. We've brought the V60 up to temp. Right. So what was he doing to bring that up? I just going through with uh, the hot kettle. Okay. So he how much batching out water through it on on the scale and everything was everything that happened in this class was happening on a scale. Okay. So everything was calculated, timed. It was right. there was no there were, nothing was done out of just spontaneous it was all calculated moves right during the class they had three um they had three gooseneck kettles that were all all temperature that they, they had the, the holding temperature to where you could set it at 211 and they could sit over in the corner and they would hold temp um he had a a, a, a timer yep. that was separate 
on his de- on the on the tabletop, and then also had a scale. Every every brew process, everything got teared out to whatever the brewer was, you know, weighing out the Chemex, weighing out the V60, weighing out the Kalia. So zeroed everything out. So everything was happening there. So Okay, so g- going back, so we brought the, the V60 up, the ceramic uh-huh. V60 up to temp, and now we have our pre-rinsed filter that goes in, and then now we're ready to add the ground coffee in. Right. And now we're starting the brew process. And this is where the mind-blowing really started happening for me. Okay. Like things like I never thought of, never did. And one of the big things that uh, Ryan showed us was putting the beans into the brewer. And no matter what your brewer was, you want the, the bed of beans, as he called it, to mirror the shape of the brewer. So the, the V60 is like a cone. So like he's going to pour all the beans in the middle and then hollow out the center so that there's like a consistent thickness from the edge of the cone to down towards the bottom of the bed. So at the bottom of the cone, it's not, you know, two inches thick. It's hollowed out and there's a consistency because as water seeping through, you want to kind of evenly distribute that water for when it's going to go through. Uh, okay. So with, with, with this little divot in the coffee, never seen that before. Was there a pattern that he was pouring water? Did he explain any of that? Do you know? Absolutely. So like, Every 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 manual brew process, there was also uh, a blooming process to pull out the, the CO2 that's in the beans. This plant was once alive. You know, beans, yep. that, you know, plants, they take oxygen, can uh, convert CO2 into oxygen, and they hold on to the CO2. So they have to bloom that out. You're, you're trying to release those carbons. And um, he said about a minute is what it takes for that CO2 to burp out. And uh, so that, that minute was, was that minute consistent through all of the brew process? process. That's right, because the carbon content in the beans is consistent, not not dependent on the brew process, but the beans. Gotcha. So you're putting the, you're putting you're putting the same beans in five different brewers. Yeah. They all need to burp because they all have the same amount of CO2 in them. So you need that blooming process. So that was it was great. OK, so we've we poured our coffee in. We got 32 grams of coffee in the in the filter. We've. Uh, cone honed it out so that we're evenly distributed of yep. layer of beans throughout. We've now poured in double the amount of coffee grinds of water bloom process. So we've poured in what is that seventy two uh, right. grams of water, and, and in that seventy two grams of water, thirty six goes in the middle, and right in the middle of that divot you made, and then the other thirty six goes in a cylindrical, a spiraling out shape. So, like, you want to concentrate half of your water of the bloom in the middle, and then the other half, you kind of make your way out to the edges. Dude, let's just say bravo to Sunnergrass for going <laughs> this deep, because this is really, this is, um, this is a very uh, thin line to walk, because once you have tasted coffee that is this controlled and this uh, detailed, it makes it very difficult to drink other coffee because you're just like, oh, this is okay. Well, and I think, too, what it also speaks to, Aaron, is when you have a great cup of coffee, you really get to appreciate the craftsmanship that was involved in making yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know, it, it's like, yeah, not this little sidebar, but I went to a, I went to a, um, a millwork shop yesterday where they do carpentry. Yeah. And these guys are like Finnish carpenters working on antique homes. And watching a guy build a spiral staircase no in a way. warehouse that they were going to take back apart and go put it inside of a house. People walk up and down those stairs and go, that's really nice. Well, yeah, I get to watch the guy build yeah. it. and like, Wow. Like really appreciate how tedious, how hard, how much time and attention took to make a great product. And that's the same thing with the, like this manual brew. Like you taste the end product you're like, wow, that's a great cup of coffee. Yeah. You probably didn't know that it took four and a half minutes yeah. to make it. Yeah. And, hours and hours of repeated repetitive training to get to where you're making it consistently. Yeah. So. And that's one of the things with coffee, the coffee snobs. I think as we dive into understanding the best cup of coffee that we can have, we start to, you know, appreciate a barista that does it with care, like that can, can move in a high traffic environment, but still produce a ridiculous good cup of coffee. And you're like, man, yep. Hey, first off, kudos, and 
first off, kudos to Son of Gras. This is amazing. So now we have, we're in the blooming process. We've went a minute. And so what was the next step? Because we're still on the V60. And That's there was right. five processes. So we've we poured the water in. We're blooming. Now we're... So after bloom, you're going to concentrate. Uh, you're going to begin your pour. Yeah. Uh, and um, you're going to concentrate the first like 50 grams right in the middle because that's where the most of the most of the beans are. And then for the next uh, and it, I don't want to say it's an arbitrary number because Ryan really knew what he was doing. Yeah. He, and he was like, trust me on this. It's going to take about four minutes. Gotcha. And he he just spiraled. And then and, and honestly, Aaron, to speak to that, he was like. Do it in three minutes if you want. Do it in two minutes yeah. if you want. Like you, you're, you're. This is all about your own palate. How long extraction process is going to take? I mean, obviously there's limit to the filter. Yeah, it's got to get through. But he was saying about four minutes, start to finish, from first drop of water bloom to when it's ready is going to take you about four minutes. So you got a minute of bloom, and then you got three minutes of pouring, and that started in the the center. Spiral outwards, spiral back inward, spiral outward, spiral back inward. So you're making like this circular motion with always trying to kind of focus back to the center. Gotcha. Said if you're brewing 600 grams, the last 50 grams of water, you really want to concentrate right to the middle because that's going to help force everything kind of evenly right toward right at the end. And, and be, when you finish with the brew process, this process, like, this just makes me so happy. I was super jealous because you also had a, a good friend of ours, Matthew, that was there with you and your wife were there. And man, I was like, dang, super jealous of what what you were getting to walk through and the knowledge you were getting to learn. So we've got our first cup, V60. How Was it good? Oh, it was phenomenal. It was phenomenal. And, and just to, to back up, the whole time that we were there, we were brewing the exact same bag of beans. So we used five different processes and they had a Ethiopian and it's a Koki. It's K O K E. Uh, and it was a honey process. And through those five different brew processes, you really got to taste different notes and, uh, different acidity levels, different mouth feels, different finishes. Uh, the, the, the traits of the Koki bean was a peach raisin berry. Um, and, and they said like, because of the honey process, it's going to have a smoothness, but a slight acidity, uh, because of like the, the extra fermentation yep. of the sugar in the honey process. So it's going to have like this more fruity acidy taste more so than something in a dry process or a wash process. So, um, but the thing was, man, Aaron, that V60 was like. Didn't have a lot of mouthfeel. Like it wasn't, you didn't, you, it wasn't, it was light to the palate, but it was really fruity. Like you're like, man, this tastes like raisins. Uh, really, really good though. Um, and that's one thing, you know, Aaron, this class was 2 30 to 4 o'clock. He brewed five pots of coffee. Six, <laughs> that's it. Like at the end, he was like, hey, we did some arrow presses. He's like, you can stick around and do these arrow presses, but literally, I mean, each, you know, pouring water was only four minutes, but the time it took to prep and prep and prep, it really showed you how long you take to be precise. Um, and, and that was that was really, really interesting, especially moving from the V60 onto the Chemex and then really getting to understand like the difference in the thickness of the filter, uh, how the water it, it would come through the V60 compared to how fast it goes through the, the Chemex filter. Um, the Chemex filter is obviously larger. It's a larger, it's a larger vessel than the V60. Um, and so the water moves a little faster, uh, but also the, the V60, uh, you know, it's that big, cir I mean, the, the Chemex is that big circle filter yep. that you have to fold up and make into a cone. Uh, and even how to put the filter in the Chemex. Yeah. Like which side goes where yeah. and which, which fold you put the beans in. Did he put the thick, did he put the thick, facing forward or the thick facing back the three sides yep. went to the front okay the okay side went to the glass i've been doing, doing it right. right okay i'm good <laughs> doing it right <laughs> I th and so many people like they're like what do i do here like is it in the middle and then you like pour it and I, like so many people here at work because we have one they like right. blow the through the filter they'll like yeah. oh i need like 
then you have to put it through a French press, like, yeah, like you're trying to, to save it. Just save it. <laughs> I'm like, just start over. Just start you're over. Like, you're like Exxon Mobil trying <laughs> to clean. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so yeah, so Timex, man, um, it was basically the same kind of prep. Like yep. you're gonna rinse the filter. You're gonna pre-soak the beans for a minute. Uh, but man, the finish of the Chemex, way more acidic way more mouthfeel like i remember having that very against the v60 and was like this tastes like a cup of coffee gotcha like what i mean by coffee i'm like i feel it in my mouth yeah I, I, it's substantial it's yep. weighty because like the v60 was almost i don't want to say tea like because you get into but it was very, it was very bright it was very light you're like hot water yeah but like the oils and stuff came more so out in the v60 where you're like you're 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 kind of t- tap in your mouth and filling it in your palate. So the question is, did he preheat the Chemex glass or did it? Nope. No, he, that, he, the water that he used to rinse the filter, he kind of slurried it around. Okay. So, it. Di- so there was a little bit of heat, but n- we're right. not talking. Okay. So, right. cause that, not that, so much like the V60 where it was like, get this because yeah. of that, that ceramic thickness is such a heat. It, t- it takes a while to get it. To, yeah. Yeah, so that was definitely different. Okay, so we've we've done the V60, the Chemex process, very similar to the V60. Drastically different taste from what it sounds like. Like, uh, uh, okay. Wait. So then, from the V60 or from the Chemex, what was the next process? My first experience ever with this was the was the Kalia. Yep. Uh, I've never had one. So that's uh, a flat bottom pour over. Just so you know. Pour. Yep. A metal. It was a metal burr. Yep. Uh, has its own special kind of uh, filter. Uh, very much, you don't have to make a divot because it's not conical shape. Yep. So the bed's flat. The brew time was a little faster, but man, the taste, yet again, just totally different from the other two. And that, that is legit from, from Chemex V60, uh, Kalia, AeroPress to the French press. The same bean tasted f- totally five different ways. And it's not like, oh man, I just had a Dr. Pepper and then I had a Mountain Dew. But you're like Coke, Pepsi, RC. Like these are all brown colas. Yeah. Like this is all coffee, but you could definitely different. It was bringing out different flavor profiles in each each one. Which is um, wild, dude. It's it's like it's so crazy how one bean, one bag can produce three different drastically t- tasting beverages. Just oh yeah, by, just by different processes, and you're—I oh. mean—and the three processes that we've currently talked about, they're very similar. Like, it, it, it's the—it's it, the Extraction process that time, right dosage, uh, what they brew into. We were all, and here's the other thing in this whole class: the water temperature, the brew time, the grind. The only thing—the only thing that changed the dosage was all the same, except the grind, because the Kalia and the French press. Uh, you're going to grind it a little finer than the other ones, which I thought was weird because I always thought French press, you're supposed to grind it like gravel, but he actually grind it finer than he did for the Chemex, the V60 and the Kalia. So we're not talking about espresso fine grind. We're talking about just slight like salt is kind of what I would say too, is like sea salt before you put it through your table grinder, Okay, but not, not powder, not espresso. Um, so when he, so when we're when Joe's describing the grind, he it's slightly l- not coarse. It's slightly finer than a coarse. We're talking about a slight right. adjustment. So still classified as coarse, just right. maybe one or two ticks toward the fine. They had a Vero grinder. Yep. And they were they were small batch grinding for us, and literally like the coarse grind was on a and, and arbitrary numbers on grinders because right. you can. You right. can make whatever number, whatever ground you want. Yep. But they were doing some on ten, and they were doing some on eight. Okay, so just know that we're it's one, it's two numbers away. So it's very not that big right. Difference. It's not. But it big, made it. But it made a difference. Three different, similar brew brewing processes, drastically different taste. First little takeaway from this: this is this is what I love about coffee because, uh, and it's something that we talked about prior to the show is. The coffee experience is so drastically different. It's what you enjoy. So somebody may enjoy a mild cup. They may enjoy a bold cup, something that, you know, um, like my brother-in-law, he likes his, you know, coffee uh, 
pre reheated and and uh, just you know just rough, but that's just what he loves. And so with this process, find a brew method that that fits your coffee style. And and so now we move to the next one, which the next process was what Joe was a French press. French press. And- and, you know, Aaron, for me, the French press was the second type of brewer I ever bought because it was $9 at Ikea. Yep. And I thought it was cool looking. I was like, yep. oh, I want one of those. And didn't know how to use it. Thought it was disgusting. Yep. I'm like, oh, it has a press on it. So you, it's called a French press. You have to press it. Man, Ryan blew my mind. Like, the way he made this. Uh, never, never, never pressed it. Uh, what? Never pressed it down. And, and I'll tell you this, it is a waste of coffee. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so much, you use so much coffee to get the, to what, to, to produce out. Um, Do you remember the hours. numbers? Yeah. Oh, man. Uh, because it isn't, it was, isn't it four to one? It was like, he put in like 54 grams and got out like under 300 milliliters of, of coffee. It was ridiculous it was four to one something like that yeah it was was crazy so in the numbers that joe joe uh, quoted remember coffee is an absorbent to water so the coffee grinds will hold water so even though you may put 600 in you're not going to yield 600 and same with they say usually about 200 uh about 200 milliliters of water is what your beans are going to retain. Gotcha. Like you're brewing 800. You put 800, 800 through, you're going to get 600 out. Gotcha. So just know in that process, if you're dialing in your coffee to water ratio and you've got, you know, 600 coming in, just know you're not going to get 600 coming out. You've got a yield that is being held in the coffee grind. So, uh, that's something to take into consideration because a lot of times people will put it on the scale and they'll measure their Chemex and maybe they'll pull the filter up. They zero out the Chemex on zero with no filter in it. Then they'll place their filter, place their grinds, and then they're like, you know what? I want to get 800, you know, milligram, uh, 800 grams of coffee out. So they pull their filter up and then they're actually over. The ratio is not correct. Because you're right. putting more through, so just know that. Like that's a variable that a lot of people don't play into a factor, but it is a variable. So we're going back to the French press because I because this one blew your mind. Dive into it. So never, so never pressed it down. And another thing you said, like with the with the French press, was uh, you don't want it super coarse. Like I always thought, man, you want to cook, you want to be like a coarse grind, almost looking like. Uh, free dries coffee from your grandpa's Folgers, like huge grinds. And he, gr- he ground it actually finer than in the V60. Uh, but then also was like that settlement that you have. He was very, um, very intentional about the way he poured it because like it was a lot left. Like he, he almost suggested uh, decanting it, like going from the French press to another vessel before even going into your cup to keep that slurry out. Okay. Um, uh, which was which was super interesting. So super he's poured the grounds in to the French press, uh-huh. and he's not put the press on yet because he still hasn't put the water in. So he pours the water in. Does he pour it in in a dosing amount? Is there just nope. just all in? And he said like you're because the difference between Chemex V60 uh, Kalia and French press is three of those are an extraction process, and one of them's an immersion brew. Like it's sitting, like it's going to sit in there and stew in there. Um, And then he did, uh, he did say like, you don't, when you pour the water in, you just let it sit because the the brewing is only happening at the top, the top like inch and a half of beans because it's sitting there. And so with about a minute left in the brew process, he gave it one stir to kind of uh, agitate the beans, the bean bed to get some more, um, to get some more water to contact ratio. So, um, so what was the time on this? Four minutes. Four minutes. Back to four minutes. So yeah. four minutes. So you've got, uh, you said 600 grams of water or 800? It was six. 600. So, the, yeah, so, but it was 600 and it was, uh, it was 38, uh, it was 38 grams, okay. you know, but the, the, the grind was a little different. 
Um, so just just so was, the yield was way less. So just That's just remember, he poured all all of the water in in one process. Let mm-hmm. it let it steep the immersion process about. One minute left, he would agitate the grind so that way it would maybe settle, and then and then the, would the coffee over time slowly start to settle to the bottom? Not well, it wasn't in the decanter long enough. Like it just stayed at the top, and then when he poured it, he put the lid on and barely pressed it past the spout just to keep the grind out. And when he poured it, Aaron, he was very like very mindful of trying to like not break that almost like puck. Okay, hold on. Okay. So this is where you this is where you explain the no pressing. So what you're saying is in the 4 minutes right when 4 minutes was ready to be done, he places uh-huh. the press or the top of the the lid on. the lid on, just press it right past the pour spout and right. then never presses the handle all the way to the bottom. Right. And then starts the pour process into the cup. Right. Yep. What in the world? Uh, like, yes. seriously, as soon as we get off here, I'm headed to our coffee. I'm headed to do this. It was it was insane. And it tasted amazing. Like, every time I've ever made French press, it's oily. Yep. It's gritty. You feel like you did it wrong because you did. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I always feel like – and the other thing, too, man, is like at the end of the day – I look at it like I don't, I don't I don't enjoy it enough to to merit the the amount of beans that you use yeah. because you don't yield a large amount yeah. because you're going to leave once it gets milk once it gets uh, that slurry gets into there he's like you're done he's like don't drink that yeah so it's kind of like this is very inefficient he's like yeah he's like it's not the most efficient process so if you don't like it go back to the Kalia go back to the V60 Okay. Well, so we have one other process and I've kept you on really long is the arrow press, right? Yes. And that was the last one that he did. Yep. He, uh, had you ever had an arrow press before? I had not. What'd and at think? that point I was about four and a half cups of coffee. <laughs> in and I was Jack. <laughs> um, and, and I'm not going to say that like, uh, they were like disparaging towards the qualities of an arrow press, but it was very much like, man, there's better ways to brew coffee. It's messy. It doesn't yield a lot. It's great for like, it's basically like a single serve yeah. uh, mechanism. Uh, it was okay. Like, I'm not buying one. Yeah. I don't, you know, I didn't, I didn't really enjoy it. Um, and so my big takeaway for the AeroPress was like, I, I mean, I guess if you went camping, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. That's, yeah. And you wanted a cup of coffee, yeah. but at that point, I don't know. I don't know. It was okay. Yeah, yeah not a fan. Well, dude, <laughs> listen. I, I I thank you for dropping the knowledge. First off, Son of Gross, thank you so much for having the class because I, if I would have been close, I would have been there. But I'm so glad that Joe was there and he was willing to share the information. Um, and one of the takeaways that you said was uh, when we were talking was how Ryan explain that this is all about your your style your your and taste that, of coffee that was a huge takeaway was he was like very much to say hey your preference what do you like it's not and he was very much like this isn't the right way this isn't the wrong way this is the way i've learned to do it experiment try it out find out what you enjoy the most and that was very encouraging like you know, I went up to him afterwards, like, hey, I don't even, I don't own a Chemex. I want to knock off off of Amazon. And he was like, cool. <laughs> like, sounds great. If you dialed it in, I'm like, I'm trying. He's like, yeah, man. And, uh, and that's what I thought was really interesting too. You know, Aaron, just a couple other mind blowing takeaways were stir your manual brew. Stir your manual brew. When you get done brewing it, before you pour it into your cup to drink it, stir it. Because, like you said a second ago, we're talking about dissolved solids. So at what started at the first minute of brewing has sat at the bottom. And so settling is happening. So um, one of the demonstrations that Ryan did, it was a sunny day in Louisville that day. He took his Chemex, stepped outside with a spoon and stirred it before he poured it to us. And you watched the color change throughout the Chemex. So you could see the different solids move up and down because he's like, if you don't stir it, your density of your solids are going to be different from the first pour 
to the last port. So what you're Which, saying is in a Chemex, sw- swirl it around before you pour it in your cup. That's right. He literally had a spoon. It was like gotcha. literally going in there and agitating it. And I was, and that was totally different. Like okay. I never thought about that. So agitate was, your coffee prior to drinking. We'll just say whatever whatever vessel it's in, if in a cup, Chemex, French press, well, I don't know, uh, French press wouldn't work. But any one of the any of the vessel that you're holding it in, stir it before you take a drink. Right. Yep, absolutely. What was the next was, one? Um, your brew temp. Like we always get so caught up in the fact of like what's it, the temp in the kettle. It's very much what's the temp and the slurry. Like, what are you doing where you're brewing it at? Um, because, like, if you, you know, and we've talked about that's super nerdy, like getting into like. It is, but dude, it's, it's. Like, but I just thought, I never thought about like, you really should measure what's hitting the beans. Yeah. Not what's in your kettle. Um, so I thought that was, I thought that was a really, a really big super nerd out moment yeah. that I really, oh, wow, I never thought of that. <laughs> oh, well, listen, after you, t- after we talked about this, I, I've, I've set every kettle that I've run into. So I, my kettle at the house and the two here at work, I set them up and like nobody's set anything because I've adjusted the temperature up so high. Brittany was like, why is the temperature so high? That's my wife. And I was like, oh, don't worry about it. This is don't what we're supposed it. to do. <laughs> She's I, like, rock my, I rock mine at 211 now. That's okay. 211, right under boiling. Right under boiling, yep. Okay. Well, dude, listen, any other big takeaways? Uh, you know, uh, man, like what you like, do what you do. Like, you know what? Like, I don't want to be like the, the snobs. Like Aaron and I don't know what we're doing. We yeah. just like what we do. Yeah. So at the end of the day, man, if you like, like right now I'm on this journey of like $9 bags of coffee from Kroger because that's where I'm at. Uh, yeah, and I, I understand. I try to make the best that I can with what I got. But but then also take the time to learn learn what different processes taste like. And then, you know, just adjust your own palate. Well, dude, Joe, thank you for taking the time today. I really appreciate it. I know that this is a very knowledgeable, like I'll go back and listen to this a few times because there's been so many takeaways. I think we've talked, this is now our, we've had multiple conversations about this and I know we'll continue because there was just so much knowledge that was dropped and I uh, cannot wait to hear more about your $9 coffee journey. And cause I know there's some bags of beans out there. Aldi is a must and we'll do a review on them But, uh, dude, thanks so much for coming on, and we will talk with you again soon. All right, man. Thanks. Thanks, buddy. So, wow, that was really interesting. Uh, Joe is a veritable treasure trove of knowledge. For sure. He's our our Louisville um, insider. For sure. Yeah. He's basically like the fourth member, maybe the third member of (laughs) the Coffee Snobs podcast. If Chad doesn't... Because yet again... (laughs) Chad Lingefeld, you let us down, buddy. Listen, you know, hey, we're uh, he's got his own tr- he's kid, got his own podcast. Chad too. has like two coffee podcasts, so he's really yeah. burning the midnight oil. Yeah. But anyway, uh, thanks very much to Joe for being a guest on the podcast again, and we look forward to continue hearing some stuff from Joe as he continues learning lots of really nerdy stuff about coffee. So for sure, for now. That is going to wrap up this episode of the Coffee Snobs podcast. If you would like to reach out to us on social media, we are on the gram at Coffee Snobs Podcast. Um, And before we mention our personal things, just a reminder, like every episode, please just take a few, you know, 15, 30 seconds, go to Apple Podcast, simply rate and review the Coffee Snobs, and that just really helps us spread the word. So hopefully... We can meet more coffee-minded people. Aaron, if people want to reach out to you, where can they find you on the interwebs? Uh, the best place is the Instagram, uh, and I post a lot in the stories, so uh-huh. make sure you check that out. It's A-A-R-O-N-B-E-A-V-E-R, Aaron Beaver, and that's on Instagram. Tyler, what about you? Uh, again, I am on Instagram and Twitter. I'm not really active a lot posting, but I am on there checking and reading things throughout the day uh, on both platforms my name is ty dancy t-y-d-a-n-c-y and again chad is not here but his social handle is chad lingafelt yep and that about wraps up this episode of the coffee snobs we will catch you guys next time adios, adios.